Hello, welcome to, the, to, to today's Bible studies on Jacob's family, family's movement to Egypt. This is in fact our, the last session on our study of the life of Jacob's family. We started with the birth of Jacob and today we are going to end up with the death of Jacob and the death of Joseph. It has been really a very interesting study. Uh, in the last episode, we learned about Jacob reconciling with men, and not Jacob, Joseph, reconciling with members of his family. You remember they had sold him to slavery, and, and that selling to slavery started a, ch a chain of events that eventually brought him into the highest administrative position in Egypt. He was assigned the drought program, the farming program, to uh, develop food reserves during the years of uh, abundance and in, in order to distribute this food to help Egypt to, uh, uh, to go through the farming without uh, uh, feeling the pains of the farming. He did this program so well, he developed so much food that during the famine, the whole world was coming to Egypt to buy grains. Uh, there was plenty of food in Egypt, even though there was famine. But everywhere else, there was severe uh, lack of food. Uh, people were looking for something to do, and they found opportunity to buy food in Egypt. Well, that affected Kenya. The, the, the famine affected Jacob's family in uh, Kenya, and when he heard that uh, there was food in Egypt, he sent his family, his boys, or men at this time, uh, to Egypt to buy grains. The first time when they came, uh, Joseph recognized them as members of his family, as the brothers that sold him. And uh, we speculated at that time whether, in fact, he was considering vengeance, we recognize that he had three choices. One of them was vengeance against his brothers. Another one was just forgive them freely without caring whether they repented or not. But the third option which he chose was to forgive them, but first of all to verify that they had repented, to determine whether he could trust them again as brothers. And he put them through a series of tests, and we found that the test culminated with when uh, Joseph, uh, Joseph's cup was planted in Benjamin's bag, and uh, they made the pact that whoever uh, was found with the cup will remain, it will be held in Egypt as a slave. They didn't know, the brothers didn't know that the cup was with any of them, and when it, the cup turned up in the bag of uh, Benjamin, um, that was the worst outcome that they could have expected. But the brothers, instead of leaving Benjamin alone, instead of saying, okay, go, go handle your fate, you stole the cup, go to jail. They all turned back, went back to Egypt and told Joseph, they didn't know he was Joseph at the time, they told Joseph that, hey, they will all stay in Egypt and become slaves that they didn't want to leave their brother alone. But Joseph rejected that and said, no, only the person who was found with the cup will stay as a slave. The rest can go home. At that point, Judah stepped forward and offered himself. He, he told, he recounted the story, their experience, how they got to that point, and then appealed to Joseph and said, please, let the boy go home and I will be your slave. At this point, Joseph realized that his brothers have all changed and are now, now can be trusted as brothers keepers. Then immediately things were set into motion to bring his family to Egypt. And that is where we start today. We will learn, essentially what we are going to learn is that forgiveness and reconciliation bear delicious fruits and we will, we will go through the experience of Joseph, uh, Jacob's family in Egypt 
how they came to Egypt and what could have prevented them, how the forgiveness, the fact that Joseph forgave his brothers and reconciled with them was what unlocked the opportunity for his family to move to Egypt. The family moved and uh, of course they survived the family because now they were given an arrival area in Egypt where they did all their animal rearing. But it's not just that they survived the family, they multiplied and prospered so much that at the time that Joseph died, he realized that their, their, their return from, to Canaan from Egypt is going to be very complicated. And he prayed for them that God will help them return to Canaan. Everything we do today is in several chapters of Genesis from 45 to 50. Obviously, we are not going to read everything. We are going to read selected sections to highlight the story. We start with Joseph's invitation to his family. As soon as he reconciled with his family, as soon as he realized he could trust them again, the first thing he did is, was invite them to Egypt. He said, please go home, bring your father, bring all your family, and I can take care of you here in Egypt. God sent me ahead of you to go prepare a place for you, to go prepare a remnant on earth where you can survive and the famine, the severe famine that has befallen the whole world. Let us look at this in Genesis 45. Genesis 45. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives for a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says, God has made me lord of all Egypt, come down to me, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen, and be near me, you, your children, and your grandchildren, your flocks and herds, and all you have. I will provide for you there, because five years of famine are still to come, are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household, and all who belong to you, will become destitute. Yes, so as soon as Joseph and his brothers reconciled, he presented them an invitation to come to Egypt. He said, please go and bring everything you have and come to Egypt. I'll take care of you here. Don't ever be distressed about selling me to Egypt because it wasn't, even though you are the person that did it, it wasn't you that sent me here. It was God that sent me ahead of you to prepare a place, a remnant, that's what he called it. A remnant being a place that is protected from the famine that has ravaged the whole world. So God sent me here to prepare this place for you and I want you now to come and take your place. I will take care of you here. But he is not the, the I mean he is the highest administrative officer in Egypt, but Egypt still was under Pharaoh. So Pharaoh's approval was needed. Well, they didn't have to work hard for the approval because as soon as Pharaoh heard what was going on, that Joseph's brothers came and Joseph must have explained to him, you know, what, what the relationship was and how things transpired. Pharaoh offered them the same invitation that Jacob, Joseph had offered them. He told Joseph, send, go and get your brothers. I mean, send your brothers to go and get their family. They can stay in the best place. I'll give them the best land in Egypt. The same Goshen that Joseph had offered them. Okay, let's continue with Genesis 45. Genesis 45. When the news reached Pharaoh, Pharaoh's palace, that Joseph's brothers had come, 
Pharaoh and all his officials were pleased. Pharaoh said to Joseph, Tell your brothers, do this, load your animals and return to the land of Canaan, and bring your father and your families back to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt, and you can enjoy the fat of the land. You are also directed to tell them, do this, take some carts from Egypt for your children and your wives, and get your father and come. Never mind about your belongings, because the best of all Egypt will be yours. The best of all Egypt will be yours. So Pharaoh confirmed, essentially confirmed the invitation that Joseph extended to his brothers. So all they needed now was for the family to accept. So the brothers loaded up, went home, and when they got home, they talked to their father. Hey, Joseph is still alive. This man, I mean, for the past 15 years or so, he has believed that his son Joseph was dead. And suddenly he's getting this news. Not only he's alive, but he is the Lord of Egypt. He's the person that the the person they've been that is selling grains to the whole world. And that he has been invited to come and join Joseph in Egypt. Let's hear what he said in Genesis 45, starting from verse 25. Genesis 45. So they went up out of Egypt and came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan. They told him, Joseph is still alive. In fact, he is ruler of all Egypt. Jacob was stunned. He did not believe them. But when they told them everything Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts Joseph had sent to carry him back, the spirit of their the spirit of their father Jacob revived. And Israel said, I am convinced my son Joseph is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. I will go and see him before I die. So Israel accepted Joseph's offer. And the next thing was they packed up, they packed up all their things and set out for Egypt. But before they left, they stopped at a place called Beersheba and prayed. Jacob was not somebody that did anything without talking to God, especially something this major. He realized was the trip that the trip to Egypt was a faithful trip and that God needed to, to bless them and give them permission to go. So the first thing he did was he took his family to Beersheba, they prayed, uh, talked with God, and then the went to Egypt. Uh, there were 70 of them and the 70 uh, members of his family that went to Egypt. And uh, the first thing that happened when they got to Egypt was Joseph met with his father for the first time since age 17. At this time, Joseph was about 32, 33 years old. Remember, he started the job with Pharaoh at 30. Oh no, it's more than that because the seven years of abundance have come and gone and now they are two years into the famine years. So 39, so between 39 40 years old. At the age of 17 was the last time he saw his father. And it was not as if he was going out to, uh, to, uh, to study or going to university or something. It was assumed he had died. So this was a very emotional meeting between the two of them. And remember to think of these people as real people. Even though the story is from the Bible, they are not spirits. They were real people that lived on this earth. So think of what it would have been, what it would have meant for the two of them meeting for the first time. Let us read about this Genesis 46, verses 1 to 7 and 26 to 30. Genesis 46. So Israel set out with all that that was his, and when he reached Beersheba, he offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. And God spoke to Israel in a vision at night and said, Jacob, Jacob, here I am, he replied. I am God, the God of your father, he said. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down to Egypt with you, and I will surely bring you back again and Joseph's own hand will close your eyes. This is a very important thing, but let's continue reading. Then Jacob left Beersheba 
And Israel's sons took their father Jacob and their children and their wives in the carts that Pharaoh had sent to him, to transport him. And they also took with them their livestock and the possessions they had acquired in Canaan. And Jacob and all his offspring went to Egypt. He took with him to Egypt his sons and grandsons and his daughters and granddaughters, all his offspring. All those who went to Egypt with Jacob, those who were his direct descendants, not counting his sons' wives, numbered sixty-six persons. With the two sons he had, that had, who had been born to Joseph in Egypt, the members of Jacob's family which went to Egypt were seventy in all. Now Jacob sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to get directions to Goshen. When they arrived in the region of Goshen, Joseph had his chariot made ready and went to Goshen to meet his father Israel. As soon as Joseph appeared before him, he threw his arms around his father and wept for a long time. Israel said to Joseph, Now I am ready to die, since I have, been, since I have seen for myself that you are still alive. Well, so the family arrived in Egypt and had this emotional meeting. And the next was to settle down in Egypt and begin to live their life because this wasn't a visit. This was, you know, settling, settling in, um, settling in a new land. The, the family delegation, the first thing they did was selected a group of them to go and meet with Pharaoh. Um, you know, Joseph came, talked to them and told them how to interact with Pharaoh when they met. Told them that they need to tell Pharaoh, you know, what they do. That they are animal farmers, that is, they, they, are, they are shepherds, essentially. So he said this was necessary for them, if, for them to be assigned the area of Goshen which was an arable area for them to live. Uh, another thing that happened was, um, you know, Pharaoh met with them, admitted them, and gave them the place in Goshen. Uh, Jacob also met with Pharaoh individually and blessed Pharaoh. At the time that they arrived in Egypt, Jacob was 130 years old. And Pharaoh did ask him about this, how old are you? Let us read Genesis 47. 1 to 12. Genesis 47. Joseph went and told Pharaoh, My father and brothers, with their flocks and herds and everything they own, have come from the land of Canaan and are now at Goshen. He chose five of his brothers and presented them before Pharaoh. Pharaoh asked the brothers, What is your occupation? Your servants are shepherds, they replied to Pharaoh, just as our fathers were. They also said to him, We have come to live here a while, because the famine is severe in Canaan, and your servants' flocks have no pasture. So now, please let your servants settle in Goshen. Pharaoh said to Joseph, Your father and your brothers have come to you, and the land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best part of the land. Let them live in Goshen, and if you know of any among them with special ability, put them in charge of my own livestock. Then Joseph brought his father Jacob in and presented him before Pharaoh. After Jacob blessed Pharaoh, Pharaoh asked him, How old are you? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, The years of my pilgrimage are a hundred and thirty. My years have been few and difficult, and they do not equal the years of pilgrimage of my father's. Then Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from his presence. Then Joseph settled his, fathers, his father and his brothers in Egypt and gave them property in the best part of the land, the district of, Ram, of Ramses, as Pharaoh directed. Joseph also provided his father and his brothers and all his father's household with food according to the number of their children. So the... Israeli family had arrived in Egypt, uh, 70 of them in all, not counting their wives and children. And uh, they met with Pharaoh, Pharaoh gave them a place to stay, told them they could occupy the area of Goshen. 
and uh, Jacob met with Pharaoh and uh, they ex uh, exchanged pleasantries. Jacob blessed Pharaoh and told uh, Pharaoh that he was 130 years old. So these are those formalities getting them settled in Egypt. Now they are settled. Their life is going to begin. And uh, let us see some of the things that happened soon after that. Uh, one thing that happened in Goshen is that the Israelis prospered. Remember, God told them in Beersheba, told Jacob, and said, Don't be afraid to go to Egypt. I will make you a nation there. So the expansion of Israel, the first expansion of Israel to become a nation. When they went to Egypt, they, they were a large family, very large family. 70 is not a small number plus. Wives and children, maybe about a hundred or something, we don't know. Seventy is what we know. It's not a small number. But they expanded, they prospered, and became really a nation in Egypt. That was the first expansion. So we can say that the promise that God made to Abraham, that he will make his, children, his descendants into several nations, you know, that he will expand his descendants and they will become a nation and will become several nations. This promise began to take shape in Egypt. It began to come through in Egypt. And there is an, a, a significant thing that had to happen for it to begin to, to uh, for the promise to begin to uh, happen. We will come to that. Let's not, uh, first of all, let's look at the things that happened. Uh, remember, Jacob came to Egypt at age of 130. He stayed 17 years in Egypt before he died. So he died at the age of 147. Just before he died, he told his people to please take him home to Canaan and bury him. He didn't want to be buried in Egypt. Then he called his children together and prophesied to them. And in this, in this prophecy, uh, we, we will not go through this in detail. It's re there is really a lot in there. But there is a basic message in the prophecy that he gave to his children. And that is, he, he in fact, told them, explained to them that life is made up of the gift that God has given you and how you have developed this gift, what you have done. So in each of them, he told them, oh, here is who you were born to be. Here is who you are going to be, and this is what happened. This is the reason for that. You know, for instance, Reuben, he said, Reuben, you were, you are my firstborn, you were born great, that you defy my home. Reuben did something that was despicable, and uh, because of that, he said, you will prosper no more. So he was, in each of them, he let them know that you are that what you are in life is made up of what you were born with, which is the gift that God gave you, and then how you develop this gift. We'll talk about this some more. When Jacob died, he was mourned for 70 days in Egypt. Then after the 70 days of mourning, they took his body back to Canaan and buried him. This is a large section of the Bible in, in Genesis, and we are not reading it because we will run short of time. But there is more, we have more important things. There is a significant thing that happened in the life of these people that we need to capture its significance to us in our life today. What does it mean to us? But first, let us look at the death of Joseph also. Uh, Joseph. Uh, remember, he was uh, 30 years old when he started in the, uh, when he joined the service of Pharaoh. And we just found out that he was about 40 years old when his family arrived in Egypt. So he died at the age of 110. From 40 to 110 is about, what, 70 years? So 70 years had come and gone from the time his family arrived to the time he died. Um, but just before he died, his brothers went to him, they were afraid. In fact, it was after their father died, they were afraid, they were still concerned about what they did to him. So they went to 
um, ask for forgiveness again. And at this point, he told them, don't worry. He confirmed to them that he has fully forgiven them and that there was no more problem between them. Then he comforted them that God will lead them out of Egypt because they had expanded so much that he realized that their departure from Egypt was not going to be simple. Also, things changed. I mean, 70 years have gone and who knows what, how much time will pass in the future before they are ready to leave. Governments change. Uh, the Pharaoh that brought them in uh, will not probably, I don't, we don't know at this time, but the Pharaoh that brought them in will eventually die. So, things will get complicated. Uh, he comforted them. He said, don't worry. God will take you back to your home in Canaan. And then he demanded that whenever they are leaving, that they should please take his bones with them, that they should not leave his bones in Egypt. What really happened here? Well, one thing we know was that the reconciliation that occurred between Joseph and his family was pivotal. It was a pivotal event. It needed to happen. Joseph could not trust his brothers without that reconciliation. He didn't know these are people that wanted to kill him. He begged them not to kill him as they recounted. Eventually, they didn't kill him. They sold him to slavery. So he didn't know that he could trust them. He, he could not interact with them. But it happened that the problem between them was like a major obstacle that was standing in the way of God's promise to prosper Israel. God's promise to make them into a big nation. Now, let us see what happened. Because they reconciled, Joseph was able, to, was able to interact with them and he quickly invited them to move to Egypt. Without the reconciliation, that would not have happened. Then, because they moved to Egypt, they were able to survive the famine and then they prospered in Egypt. That means the promise that God made about the expansion of the Israeli people started in Egypt because they had that reconciliation. It was that reconciliation that opened the way for them to go to Egypt. Um, but the, the reconciliation really made this difference because somebody will say, hey, God has already promised them. So if, um, if Joseph didn't reconcile with them, God will find another way to do it. Well, we'll find that that is actually not true. Because what God does is give you an opportunity. The, the, the problem that existed between him and his friends was like an obstacle in their way. Think about it, he could not. If he did not reconcile with them, then they could not have gone to Egypt. There wasn't a way. There wasn't a way for them to go. And the family, remember he told them that he was bringing them out of the famine in Canaan so that they, they don't become destitutes. And that is true. If they had stayed in Canaan, they would have seen great poverty. And who knows how many of them would have died and who knows what would have happened. So the fact that he was able to forgive them, that, he, that they were able to show him that they have, in fact, uh, not only repented, but they have become now different people, that they have become brothers keepers instead of brothers killers, that they could be trusted as partners. This is what they demonstrated to them. And God creates, what well, God gives us opportunities. He doesn't really develop the opportunities. Of course, as we try to develop the opportunities, He helps us. But we have a choice. We have a choice to develop the opportunities given to us. If, if you choose to develop the opportunities, then you will reap the fruit of the opportunities you develop. But if you abandon the opportunities, well, the opportunities will be taken away. 
In fact, this is what Christ told us in the parable of the talents. And we will look at this in Matthew 25, verses, 20, verses 14 to 28. Matthew 25. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with the two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with the five talents. You see, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two talents also came. Master, he replied, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered a seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I had harvest where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent with him. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. Take the talent from him and give, give it to the man who has ten, ten talents. What is talent? Talent in this parable represents opportunities. Opportunities that God gives to us. He creates opportunity for human beings and it is up to human beings what they do with the opportunity. You make a choice. Like the, the person that received uh, the opportunity represented as five talents or the other one that received the opportunity represented as two talents. Each of them developed the opportunity and they, they, will, they will reap the harvest, they will reap the, the fruits of developing the opportunity. But the person that hid the one talent is like someone giving an opportunity but he fails or refuses to develop the opportunity. And what did God say? That the, even the one given to him will be taken away and given to someone else. So, yes, God had promised the people of Israel that he will make them into a nation. He had told their father Jacob and their shepherd, I will make a nation out of you in Egypt. Well, no, they, by that time the obstacle has already been removed. It's the promise that he made to Abraham, which will be implemented through Jacob. So he had promised to Jacob in Bethel that in fact his children will be innumerable, that he will make a nation out of his descendants. Yes, the promise was there, but here Joseph could have derailed that promise. The, the pro, not Joseph himself, but the problem between him and his brothers. He made a choice. He had to make the right choice. And the right choice led him to open the, the door for the opportunity to be developed. If he did not make the right choice, the opportunity would not have been developed. They would have gone in a different direction. You think of it as a... Um, think of it as an obstacle standing in front of you. On the other side of the obstacle is God's promise. To the people of to make Israel into a nation, and on the other side was just you know Joseph and his brothers, and then the obstacle is the quarrel between them. They needed to remove that obstacle 
in order to get to the fulfillment of God's promise. They remove the obstacle by finding reconciliation. So the personal choices we make in life, God creates opportunity for us, but the personal choices we make determines what happens to the opportunities. If you make the right choice, then you will develop your opportunity and you reap the fruits. But in this particular case, Joseph made the right choice, he and his brothers. It was not really his brother, it was him. He didn't know what choice he was making, but he knew he needed, he needed reconciliation with his brothers and he sought and found through reconciliation. So that was the right choice. If he did not find reconciliation, his brothers would not have gone to Egypt. They would not have been invited to come to Egypt. And they would have stayed in Canaan and whatever, who knows what would have happened to them in Canaan. But the history of Israel would have been different. So the choice he made was pivotal. It was, if he didn't make that choice, the course of history would have been different. The fact that he found reconciliation with his brothers was pivotal. It was very, very important. So Joseph chose reconciliation and because he regained what reconciliation meant here was the, his brothers regained his trust and they got to know him again and regained his trust. They already didn't have problem, you know, they, they, they were looking at him as a stranger and this big man was, that was really ruling Egypt. But when he made himself known to them, they realized that the person they were talking to was in fact their brother. So that trust was regained. The brothers regained his trust, he regained their trust, and then they began to interact, and it was this, uh, the fact that they had begun to interact positively is what opened the door for his family to be invited to move to Egypt. If, if that didn't happen, the history of that family would have been different. Maybe we wouldn't be studying it today. It is the fact that they found reconciliation. That's what led them to the path that they, they finally took. Well, what does this mean to us? Choose reconciliation. It doesn't matter what the problem is between you and any member of your family. Between you and your brothers, between you and your sisters, between you and your parents, or between your family and the neighboring family. It's important to seek reconciliation because when you find reconciliation, then your normal interactions with those people will resume. If you reject reconciliation, then it is like leaving an impediment, a major obstacle in your way. And in the case of the people of Israel, we, we understand the obstacle because that is history. We can look back and see. For them, what was the obstacle was the problem between Joseph and his brothers. And what was on the other side of the obstacle was God's promise to Israel. God's promise to make a nation from Israel. Joseph chose reconciliation. So the obstacle was removed and God's promise was fulfilled. If they did not remove the obstacle, things would have been different. So in your own case, you can ask, what is on the other side of the obstacle? The obstacle may be, the obstacle in this case is a quarrel, a, a dispute or whatever that lies in the family between you and another member of the family, between you and your brother, between you and your sister, between you and your parents, or between you and your, and your uncle. 
So you ask yourself, what is on the other side? What is this impediment preventing? What is this obstacle preventing? Well, you don't know. That's the problem. You don't know. It may be small and inconsequential, but it may be major. It may be the fulfillment of God's promise to your family that you are not aware of. That the, I mean, we can see a real case here where the removal of an, an impediment that was a quarrel between Joseph and his brothers opened the way for fulfillment of God's promise to his family. This is real. We saw it in the Bible story. In our own case today, we don't know. We don't know what is on the other side of a major impediment in our family. It could be something big that you are preventing by not reconciling. Well, what does reconciliation mean? Because I say choose reconciliation. How do we do that? Well, in the case of Joseph, remember, he, the reconciliation started by him forgiving his brothers. So, we, our emphasis here is on an individual. You, you, if you want reconciliation, first you have to recognize that whatever you did wrong needs to be forgiven. You need to seek forgiveness for whatever you did wrong. Forgiveness needs repentance, you remember? That, and in the case of Joseph's brothers, they repented. They didn't really know that Joseph was still alive. So it was not a matter of trying to impress Joseph. Their father didn't know how, what happened, so it was not a matter of trying to impress their father. It was a matter that in their heart, they realized that they did something wrong. You remember when they were talking about it, discussing among themselves, they said, you remember what we did to our young brother? He begged us not to kill him. And somehow we let his blood, let, you know, we, we didn't listen to him. We sold him to slavery and they don't know they believe he was dead. So they regretted it in their heart. They really felt that they did something wrong. So what you need to do as an individual is search yourself for what you did wrong, whatever it is, and then repent from it. Repent means promise yourself you will never do it again. Be sorry that you did it and promise yourself you will never do it again. Show yourself to be a trustworthy partner. How did the brothers show themselves to be a trustworthy partner? When their junior brother got into trouble, they said, okay, all of us are going back to Egypt. We'll go back to Egypt and become slaves with our junior brother. What they were showing there is now that they are willing, they are ready to do whatever it takes to protect their brother. In this case, what they could do was go to jail or go to slavery, go into slavery with him because they couldn't fight. They believed he, they thought he stole the car or something. So there was there was no way to there was no other way to protect him, but the protection they could give him was stay with him. And they offered to do that. So that's one way to show yourself to be a trustworthy partner. What about Judah? How did he show himself to be a trustworthy partner? Remember, Joseph rejected the brothers being, all the brothers being slaves in Egypt. They said, look, he said, only the person who was found with the cup will stay as a slave. The rest of you can go. Then Judah stepped forward and offered himself to go, to go into slavery in place of Benjamin. He said, please let the boy go home. Judah did not know he was talking to Joseph. So it's not a matter of trying to impress Joseph. He didn't, all, all he knew was something has gone wrong before and I'm not going to let it go wrong again. Somebody will say, oh, Judah was simply doing this for the sake of his father. It may be true. Maybe all he was just doing it 
because he felt bad for his father and he had promised his father but it really doesn't matter because the word it is your appreciation of your father your desire to be good to your father or to your parents is what motivates you to be good to your siblings because you know it is important to your parents you you are you you are you are motivated to protect the interests of your parents you are motivated to to be sensitive to the needs of your parents and to do what you can to help provide for those needs one of the needs of your parents is to take care of your siblings so if he did this because of his feelings about jacob that is fine but in his feeling in trying to protect jacob, uh, jacob feeling he protected benjamin as well in fact he offered he made the ultimate sacrifice the ultimate offer he offered himself to go to slavery in the presence of of uh, benjamin you will ask here yeah, what about the other person what about the other party if i should do all this search myself to find what i did wrong repent from them what about the other party well don't think don't worry about the other party remember what we read in romans chapter 12 verse 18 where paul was telling the romans he said if at all possible to the extent that it depends on you live at peace with everyone which was being said in a recognition that there is something you as an individual can do forget about whether the other person plays his or her part do your own because your successful fulfillment of your part will actually influence the other people the most important thing is that you have to show yourself to be a trustworthy partner just like judah showed himself to be a trustworthy partner and as soon as he did that, Joseph didn't need to be convinced. Reconciliation. The fruits of reconciliation are very delicious. We have seen a very good example. You need to seek reconciliation in order to enjoy the fruits of reconciliation. They are too delicious to abandon. We thank God for today's Bible study. We thank God for all those. I didn't ask you whether you have a question. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm fine. You're fine, yeah. yeah. We thank all those that will get an opportunity to view the video or to listen to the audio file. And we pray that you will learn something that will make a positive impact in your life and bring you closer to God's purpose. God bless you.